Did you have a children's table at your house growing up? I did at mine. One of my favorite things was at my Nana's house. She would set up this little card table for me and my three cousins. We were all within about four years of each other under the big hickory tree where my grandfather had hung a swing. And she would pour us big, tall glasses in the summertime of pineapple juice and ginger ale. I can still taste it. Hospitality to children. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. But the children's table also serves another purpose, if we were honest. Gets them a little bit out of the way of foot traffic at Thanksgiving. Grandma and Grandpa Garcia put the children's table for my two children and their two cousins, also very close to the same age, in the kitchen. There's something in common to this particular sacrament is it always includes unbreakable cups and plates. One of the fondest memories of my husband's family was um, from when he and his two brothers were young-ish. I think they would be ashamed to know that they were probably in their teens or 20s, but nonetheless, they were at the children's table because that's what you do. And I don't know exactly, someone usually has to die before you move up, right? <laughs> so Mike and Henry, the two brothers, got into a legendary fight over mom's potato salad. It was so legendary that it was, the, the whole story was quoted on the videotape at our wedding. And um, thanks to me, it got repeated as part of the eulogy at Grandma Garcia's funeral. And it got a big laugh at the funeral. I mean, she really was an amazing cook. Uh, her potato salad was worth a good food fight. But what was really funny to me was that Mike and Henry were not laughing. This was a dispute that was still unresolved. <laughs> they will probably go to their graves arguing over who ate that last spoonful of the potato salad. Well, the bad news that we read here in the book of Philippians is our church behavior is sometimes not a whole lot better than our behavior at the children's table at grandma's house. Now, sure, when we come forward to the table of communion, uh, in worship, we're usually on our best manners, but it's in other settings that we might be just the least bit testy to one another. Remember that we are called by Jesus to be, uh, become like little children, I think, in a lovely childlike way and not in an ugly childish way. So I loved how Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, calls out these women by name, Poor Tom Young, I am so sorry I gave you those names to pronounce. <laughs> Euodia and Syntyche. These are not names that are commonly given to our little children as baptism names, are they? Means good odor, Euodia. <laughs> I suppose maybe more gently translated as pleasant smelling or something. <laughs> Syntyche is, means lucky, but honestly, I don't think uh, that's a very lucky name either, at least not if you had to spell it in the first grade. But my point is, you got to love it when you get called out in an actual letter in the Holy Bible. <laughs> hey, you, Euodia, mind yourself. Or you, Syntyche, stop fighting with Euodia. That had to be a proud moment for them when that <laughs> letter was read in the church in Philippi. Make peace among yourself. It is a difficult thing. And I confessed in um, my view from the earth, if you're not signed up for our weekly online devotional, here's your little commercial message. You may call the church office and sign on. I made a mistake, by the way. I said this was from the first, I quoted this bit from Paul where it says, um, uh, da, 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 da. let your gentleness be known to everyone. <laughs> I quoted it as 1 Thessalonians 4, which I had to look up when I realized it's actually Philippians. It's 1 Thessalonians warns you to not be lustful like the heathens. Well, it's good advice too, but it wasn't today's lectionary. <laughs> um, but in Philippians, 
this thing about gentleness cracked me up, as it would anybody who's been attending our Sunday night class, because Paul, Paul is not particularly gentle or patient in his letters. We had just gotten through reading about Paul raving at the Galatians about the dangers of circumcision and raving at the Corinthians about uh, doing things properly and in order and, you know, exhorting the Romans to not rely on their good works to be saved, but rather their faith in God. He was the least gentle, patient, and kind person in the world, which is probably why I love him so much. It is not my strength to be patient. And so I appreciated this good advice that Paul gives. I think that because he was writing from prison, we don't know whether his first imprisonment at Ephesus or his last imprisonment in Rome, but as a Christian in prison, he didn't know but what it was his last imprisonment. And it is in that light, facing his own death likely, that these are his words to the church in Philippi. Euodia, Syntyche, for God's sake, get along with each other. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It was an outrageous thing that we pilgrim people did when we landed on this shore, that we held a feast of thanksgiving in the fall, the first autumn of our time in this country. Because the first winter, so many of those pilgrims had died. It was a bit counterintuitive to give thanks to God right before another harsh winter was upon them. But they were doing their best to follow this practice of thanksgiving in times of darkness and danger and hardship. That is when it's the hardest to do, I think, to give thanks, when things are the hardest in our lives. And it's the most important time to give thanks, Paul would say. When things are the most difficult, those are the times we need to rejoice, to be glad, to find things to be thankful for. My, one of my favorite moments of the children table reenacted was with those same four cousins I mentioned who sat with me under the hickory tree. Their father, my uncle Don, had passed away and we were in South Carolina. And um, as my cousin Donald had triplets my son's age, we had quite a few um, high school, college aged young adults. and. Um, so he made the wise decision to go to the Golden Corral <laughs> with five boys about 20 years old. All you can eat seemed like a really good idea. <laughs> but I loved reenacting the same thing that happened in my grandmother's house. There was the booth for the young adults and the booth where I sat with my 90-year-old aunt. <laughs> the adult table. I had graduated. And what they did was they got into arguments over iPhones and droids. <laughs> but it was a beautiful children's table moment. You know, as family connects and makes those bridges to the next generation of family. There was much to be thankful for on that day, even in the midst of our loss. And so it's the same with us in churches. We need to keep our focus on what's most important, the love and fellowship we share among us, and not the petty details. I shared with you last week that Jennifer and I sometimes are reluctant to let people outside the church know what we do for a living because they're often very free to tell us their stories of how their churches in the past have hurt them or the stupid petty things that happened that drove them away. I recently was, when I was in California, I heard the story of how um, a young man left the church where he was a volunteer youth leader because when they were in the midst of a fundraising campaign, somebody made some comment that nobody cared about his opinion about the money because he didn't have any money to give and the important people in the church who gave a lot of money were gonna be listened to. Oh my. I mean, what do you say to that? I am so sorry that happened to you. 
Sometimes it's even more petty. I loved at my last church that there, was, uh, there were people who said they hadn't been attending that church since they recovered the pew cushions, that hideous orange. <laughs> and trust me, it was a hideous 1970s orange, but really? There had to have been some kind of in, uh, uh, interior decoration fight in that church is all I gotta say, because it seemed a little bit much to me. But these little things matter, it turns out. And I offer you that as a reminder for very practical reasons. Every year at the Yankee Fair, Jennifer and I have people come into our offices with hurt feelings. Every year, somebody gets yelled at, or somebody is made to feel stupid, or somebody has been made to feel not needed in somebody's booth. It's that um, who moved my cheese argument, I think, <laughs> with all due respect to those of you who sell cheese at the fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's too easy in our stress to get tied up in, what happened, why are my brownies not put out and her brownies were put out first and why were hers got a higher price than mine? Take a deep breath, my people. <laughs> Be patient. Let your gentleness be known to all. We, we have three high holy days here at the Congregational Church of Brookfield where we receive many of our friends and neighbors who are, well, maybe not lost sheep, but people we have not seen in a while. We need to be patient with them. We need to show what a wonderful, loving church we are and that we can be. I encourage you to wear your welcome committee Why I Love My Church Badges next Saturday, our third High Holy Day, Yankee Fair Day. <laughs> Let your gentleness be known to all. Let the love and fellowship that we have come to know in this place be a very radiant light of Christ shining into our community, our world, and especially among the little ones who find their way here again. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen. <laughs>